God's good, amen. amen. God is good. I've been walking around and praying and asking people because I've never had this happen before. But I do believe that God is trying to break the spirit of religion. Yes. Yes. And in America, we like to get in and get out. So I told the people after I prayed and saw, I'm going to preach because it's not about just getting in the church and being done in 45 minutes. And Jamie, <laughs> Jamie laughs because he knows that's not here. But church, I do believe that God has given me a word that will bless people So I do want to give it because today is Palm Sunday uh, yeah and and for the Christian faith Palm Sunday we is it's the the start of the Holy Week it's where Jesus shows up the king of the universe on a donkey it's his triumphant entry into Jerusalem and I I think about that time and I think about him arriving on a donkey and everyone around I think about his disciples who don't fully understand what he's about to go through, but they're there. I think about the people in Jerusalem and all those around before him and after him who are laying down their cloaks and who are cutting branches and laying them down on the road before him, uh, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Greatly to be praised. Filled with a hope they were soon to recognize that they believed that this man, Jesus, the great prophet, was going to overcome the government, the one that they've been waiting for, to set them free, fully filled with hope, a hope that was soon going to turn into doom and gloom for them, because they didn't understand what Jesus was going to do. Those who were praising Jesus Christ that day as he was walking in were the very ones who reviled him. The very ones that stood there before him and, and screamed at him and, and shouted to send him to the cross. This is the same people who are laying everything down before him. And I thought about that I, in our passage of Hebrews. I, I just thought about the word hope. Because hope is an interesting word, church. It's a very interesting word. Because it doesn't take long to look around the world and, and see that we need hope. Amen. And this is what I've realized, church, is that where we place our hope in will either lead us to being hopeful, peaceful, joyful, and expectant. Or the exact opposite. If we put our hope in something of this world, it produces hopelessness, a lack of peace, a joyless life, and one that becomes non-expectant of the things to come. Man, that was, that was the people that day on Palm Sunday. Man, they had joy. They had peace. They were ready. They were expectant. But then they lost it. Because they put their hope in the wrong thing. And I want to tell you this morning, church, that this is a unique service because I believe that God is doing something. I believe that he wants you to know that there is a hope out there. And I believe he wants us to know that we need hope. We need hope. But it's not just a normal hope that we need. Church, we need an inexhaustible hope. One that never dies away. We need a hope that's unfailing no matter what comes our way. We need a hope that's not predicated on our dreams or our imagination. But a hope that's sustained on a solid rock. On the solid rock on which we stand, which is Jesus Christ himself. Amen. There's a great German theologian that I like to read, Rudolf Boltmann. And this is what he says about hope. Hope is not a consoling dream of the imagination which causes us to forget our present troubles. 
nor are we warned of its uncertainty as in the Greek world. The life of the righteous is grounded in hope. To have hope, to have a future, is a sign that things are well with us. And this hope comes from God. Church, on April 2nd of 2023, we need a hope that washes away the fear that comes inside of us when we think about the future of America. We need a hope that washes away the fear that comes inside of us when we think about our own individual lives and what's coming in our future alone. And we need to replace that with an everlasting peace, a peace that only comes through Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus Christ says in John 14, 27, peace I leave you, my peace. I give you, not as the world gives. So don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Palm Sunday. I want you to know if you're here today and you don't have peace, I want you to know that there is a peace that we can obtain from Jesus Christ himself when we enter into an intimate relationship with him in which Jesus blesses us with an inexhaustible hope for today and the days to come. That it comes through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. This is the hope that we need in our lives, that we need in our hearts. It's an inexhaustible hope that's built on something other than ourselves. It's an inexhaustible hope that's built on something other than our family members. It's an inexhaustible hope that's built on something other than our friends. It's an inexhaustible hope that's built on something other than our savings account or retirement accounts. An inexhaustible hope is built on something other than our good circumstances because I want to tell you, church, I want to tell you that you're going to let yourself down. There are going to be days in your life when you're going to sit here and think, I've tried everything and I keep messing up. You need to build upon the inexhaustible hope of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you that your family members will let you down. That in the most time or when you need it most, that your friends should be there at the most for you. They're going to fail you. And I want you to know that the economy, it doesn't take long to realize that it's fluctuating and it will crash. So our inexhaustible hope is not predicated or built on anything of this world. It's built on the one who created the world and sustains the world, Jesus Christ himself. It's predicated and built upon the, the blood of Christ that is founded in the word of God that shows the promise of God is unshakable. Do you want an unshakable hope? Come to Jesus. the hope that we have as Christians and the hope that the world needs. It's a hope that the school in Nashville needs. It's a hope that Midland University needs. It's a hope that the businesses in Fremont need. It's a hope that some of us in here need. And I want to show you guys that we can have it. If you're a guest, we've been going through the book of Hebrews. And I want to show you today that if you're here and you're struggling with hope, like you wake up and you're lifeless, you wake up and it's just another day, I want to show you from God's word, the very word that is true, that's living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the innermost beings of our, our own heart, I wanna show you that you can have an inexhaustible hope because it's not built on what you do. It's not built on what you can do. It's built on what God has done. You'd find in Hebrews 6, 13 through 14, it says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, do you realize that when we make promises in our lives, we typically say, I swear to God. I swear on my mother. I like that. <laughs> I swear on my mother's grave. I swear on something because we have to affirm our promise. But God swears on himself. 
saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. Church, you want a hope that's unwavering? You want a hope that's not dictated or predicated on your circumstances or you want a hope that's gonna sustain you day in and day out? Do you want the inexhaustible hope? Because it's found in the promise of God. It's found in the promise of God that was given to Abraham and fulfilled many years later through Jesus Christ, his only son. For those who don't know, if you go to Genesis, you see in Genesis 12, one through two, a man named Abraham. Really the first one post the Noahic flood. And I don't know why God chose him other than his grace and mercy. But God chooses Abraham and he says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that it will be a blessing. If you flip forward three chapters in Genesis 15, 5, God comes to Abraham again and says, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. How many of you guys have ever stood outside and tried to count the stars? I mean, there's some things that drive you crazy. One is trying to understand the whole uh, complexity of God, but another one is trying to count the stars. But God says, if you're able to number the stars, so shall be your offspring. God's declaring. There's some of you here who need to hear God declare something over you. God's promising. And there's some of you here who need to know the promise of God. God is putting into motion what we call the Abrahamic covenant. It's a covenant that's gonna bless future generations and all the nations if Abraham just believed what God was telling him. If you flip forward another couple chapters of Genesis 17, you'd see God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. So man, we just fast forwarded through many chapters of Genesis, which is great. <laughs> But what you need to know is that Abraham had a son called Isaac, named Isaac. And it's from his wife, Sarah, the one who couldn't bear him a child. And so it's a supernatural event that God does on their own family. A supernatural event where he has Sarah have this child. And God is promising Abraham a promise that his future generations, his family to come, the offspring that's going to happen is going to come through this child, Isaac. But God declared something to Abraham. To know that Abraham would trust him, he tells him to go. To know that Abraham would trust him, he says, leave your kindred. Abraham had to, Abraham had to go. He had to trust God with a promise that he was going to fulfill what he spoke to him. And God is doing that. And if you see in Genesis 19, God, he makes it happen. Sarah births Isaac. Now let me ask you a question here this morning. How many of you here have broken a promise in your life? Oh man, you sinners. <laughs> no. How many of you here have had someone else break a promise towards you? It's not good if you guys all raise your hand for breaking a promise, but haven't had one broken to you. Church, this is what I know. When someone breaks a promise, it devastates us. It crushes us. It has the ability to plant a seed of bitterness or resentment from us towards that person. But most importantly, when someone breaks a promise, it causes us to not trust that person anymore. And my guess at this point for Abraham, he might be guessing this or feeling this way towards, towards God. God made a promise to Abraham that he would have a great offspring, that he would have a family lineage that would bless 
many people. God declares this and God shows up and, and supernaturally provides the son that he spoke over him. And the son is born and now God is saying, guess what, offer that son a sacrifice now. What do you mean? You promised me, God. I've cried out for this very son and you finally gave me your promise and now you want me to kill him? You don't read in Genesis that Abraham waited. What you read is God shows up to Abraham and says, offer this son. And the next morning, Abraham saddles his donkey and goes. And I can only imagine the turmoil. Maybe the fear, the, the anxiety, the, the anger, maybe that bitterness starting to seep in uh, for, for Abraham as he is going to offer his son. And as Abraham finally gets to the point where he's going to offer a sacrifice, Isaac, while continually to build his son's spirit as any father would do for a son or daughter where you to make them believe that something good is going to happen even though you know something bad is going to happen. Don't worry, God will provide the sacrifice. And as, as Abraham lifts up the knife to kill his son, the angel of the Lord comes and says, don't touch him. Depending on your translation, you would see the words, for now I know you fear me. Now I know you trust me. Church, an inexhaustible hope that isn't predicated or derived from us is solely given by God as a promise to Abraham that came to fruition many years later through the God-man, Jesus Christ. And because of that promise that was given to Abraham and fulfilled through Jesus Christ years later, we have, we can obtain this inexhaustible hope that God bestows upon his children. Church, I want you to know it has nothing to do with us. Nothing. It has everything to do with God supplying and offering his son, Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice. It has everything to do with God making a promise and fulfilling that promise for the nation of Israel that you and I benefit, benefit from since we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit has entered into our life. It has everything to do with God swearing upon his own name and making an oath to Abraham that solidifies Abraham's trust that guarantees an inexhaustible hope for you and I. Why is it a hope for us? Simple. Paul says in Galatians 3, when Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. You notice how he doesn't say because Abraham worked for God? It's because Abraham believed God. He trusted him. He had a deep conviction that God was going to do what he declared, what he promised. And I want to encourage you today that when you believe God and his promise, that in Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain, that you are forgiven from today forward. It's credited as righteousness, but not yours, Jesus Christ. He clothes you and robes you in his righteousness. Paul goes on in Galatians 3, 6 through 8 and says this, so understand that those who have faith Check it, all those of you who like to do works. I know what James says. Those who have faith, Paul specifically doesn't say faith, or, or Paul specifically doesn't say works. Those of you who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. We are Gentiles. But we are children of Abraham because of the promise of God and faith in Jesus Christ. Church, this is why our hope 
that we have today is an inexhaustible hope through Jesus Christ because it was sworn by God, promised by God, fulfilled by God to Abraham that, that ended in the life of Jesus Christ. All Abraham did was believed what God was declaring. And for us today, we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ and believe what God has declared in the life of Christ to be counted as righteousness. And from that moment on, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. God's very own spirit will dwell inside of you and make the transformation that goes from the inside to the outside. It's a foreshadow of what God would do with Abraham's family, with his very own son. The offering of Isaac was to show what God was gonna do with his very own son, Jesus Christ. So let us brag even more about Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain for the remission of our sins and now clothes us in his righteousness and justifies us before a holy, blameless, righteous God. Inexhaustible hope. Inexhaustible hope. If you want, and you want it this morning, Know that salvation has nothing to do with what you can offer to God. Salvation has nothing to do with what you have done or what you can do. It has everything to do with what God the Father has done by offering and delivering Jesus Christ, his son. That's why it's an inexhaustible church It can't diminish because it's built upon Jesus' work and not our work. It's built upon the cross of Jesus Christ. It's built upon the life that overcame the grave. If it was built on anything of us, we would crumble. But Abraham got it. He got it. He believed. Why? I believe because he knew that God could not lie. Abraham knew that God could not lie. God even goes beyond Abraham and just making a promise and makes an oath to Abraham. So look at Hebrews in verse 17. It says, so when God desired to show more convincingly. So God's already made a promise and sworn on his name, but now he's going to make an oath to just stamp it. To fully convince Abraham. To the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Abraham didn't ask for an oath. Abraham didn't ask God to show him more convincingly. God knew that Abraham needed to hear an oath from him to help assure Abraham that God would not lie to him. And maybe you're here today and you think God's a liar. Maybe you're here today and you think that God has never been around you, that he doesn't know what you went through, but I attest to you that he does because he showed up in human form, Jesus Christ, and walked the same life that you and I walk. I say this often, I'll say it all the time as long as God has Eric and I here. We serve a God who is not distant, but a God who is present. Not a God who is far off when you're in the mess, but a God who is in the mess with you. A God who doesn't uh, want you to clean yourself off, but a God who's going to get in and clean you off. He made an oath. And you know, church, I believe this is what our problem is in America. I believe that we come to God in the view or the lenses of what we have in this world. See, we have lies shoved down our throat every single day. Want me to show some? The news. The moment you get on the news, it's flooded with the lies of the media that elevate their propaganda, that appease the powers that be. And if you think it's just CNN, Fox News does it also. How about social media? You get on social media, you see all these great pictures of people and couples and smiling and laughter and all this stuff, but it, it honestly creates a false 
uh, false reality of what people are actually going through in life. How about a, a job promotion? Where we like to tell a story or anything of that nature so that we can stretch the truth in order to be accepted and get promoted into the promotion. Did you know that God does not stand for even just a little bit of a stretch? So all you fishermen who catch this fish but make it this, he's not pleased. <laughs> How about when it comes to our marriages? Let's get real here, those of us who are married. Let's get real. When it comes to our marriages, we lie. It, it's, it's not funny it's okay to laugh, but I'm telling you, I've seen it. We lie when we become emotionally connected with someone in the opposite sex. We lie to our spouses when we've been hiding the addiction of pornography. We lie to our spouses when we spend money beyond our mutual agreement. And we lie when it finally comes to the truth and our spouse challenges us. How about when it comes to our friends asking if we really said that about them that really hurt them and respond with, I would never do that. How about in our own individual Christian lives when we've been struggling with unconfessed sin of any nature and by God's grace, he's brought it to light so that he can uh, elevate you and break you free rather than to keep you bound, but we say it's not true. We live in a world full of lies. And lying always plants a seed of doubt in a believer or non-believer. Lying will always plant a seed of doubt or faithlessness in our hearts that will in return have us believe that God is a God who will come up short and not honor his word. But church, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. It's against God's very nature and character to lie. Because lying has everything to do with deception and spreading deception. And God is a God of revelation. He's not a God of deception. He's a God of revelation. He wants to reveal to you his love for you. He wants to reveal to you the great lengths he went to restore you to him. Our God is a covenant keeper, a promise keeper, a God who is unable to lie. You don't believe me? Let me show you. Verse 18. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Abraham believed because Abraham realized that God could not lie. And I want you to know, church, no matter how many times someone has lied to you, no matter how many times someone has fallen through on their promise or came up short upon their word, I want you to know that the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ himself, cannot lie and cannot fall short of what he's decreed because God is not a human. He showed up in human form. He was existent before that. Self-sufficient. All authoritative. Full of glory. Glory full of honor. He's God. He cannot lie. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. This is why scripture say in Numbers 23, verse 19, God is not man that he should lie. Tell them they can join us, Ruth. God is not man that he should lie. Or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Titus in the New Testament goes on to say that God cannot lie. You want an immovable, 
unshakable, inexhaustible hope, it is found in Jesus Christ. That's why the Gospel of John was very, very careful to write that when Jesus showed up, he was full of grace and truth. Not grace and deception. Grace and and truth because everything that Jesus spoke was true and is true. Why does that matter? This is why. Jesus Christ is the culmination of God's revelation. You're here this morning, you want to know who God is? You're here this morning, you want to know how God would respond to you? If you're living in sin? You want to know how God would walk alongside you if maybe you're trapped in a hard circumstance? You want to know how God would respond to you if you were lonely and afraid? You want to know how God would respond to you if you were the social outcast? It's Jesus Christ. The one who set the captives free. The one who extended mercy. The one who extended grace. The one who extended forgiveness. The one who loved those that no one else wanted to love. The one who went to bat against the religious elites who thought they were everything. That's God. And he does not look at you and say, you pitiful fool. Jesus Christ will show up and say, sin no more, but you're forgiven forevermore. He is the culmination, the ending point of God's revelation. That's what Hebrews is all about. Jesus is greater It's all about a progression of God's revelation of who he is and what he says about you and what he wants for you. And it finally culminates in the life of Jesus Christ, God himself. He sent his son for you that while you were sinning, Christ dies. They needed to hear that word, church. The Hebrews needed to hear that word. If you're a guest, sorry if you're a regular attendant, but if you're a guest, they put their faith in Jesus Christ and they were excommunicated from their families. They put their faith in Jesus Christ and they could no longer buy food from the market. They put their faith in Jesus Christ and were made fun of or spit on or flogged. They needed an encouraging word like this. And I'm guessing there's people here that need this. Church, we need to hear that Jesus is the anchor of our souls. We need to hear that Jesus, <laughs> that he, it's not a dead faith, but it's a living faith in Jesus Christ, that he is alive and well and thriving. We need to hear that Jesus Christ is not in the tomb, but he has risen and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, interceding on our behalf. An intercession that allows us as children of God to come boldly to the throne of grace. We need to hear that today because an anchor of our souls a forerunner of our faith, the high priest of our prayers, and the hope that removes the curtain is the good that we can cling to when we can't see in the midst of the bad that we can't escape. I'll say that again for you because it's a tongue twister. We need to hear that today because the anchor of our souls, a forerunner of our faith, the high priest of our prayers, and the hope that removes the curtain 
is the good that we can cling to when we can't see in the midst of the bad that we can't escape. It's an inexhaustible hope that's founded upon and predicated on Jesus Christ. My question here today is this. Do you have the inexhaustible hope? Do you have that inexhaustible hope? When things go away, things go south, do you have the inexhaustible hope that you can cling to? When you watch your retirement shrink, do you have the inexhaustible hope that you can cling to? When you go through the marriage problems, do you have the inexhaustible hope that you can cling to? When doctors can't seem to find what's wrong with you, do you have the inexhaustible hope that you can cling to? Because you can today. His name is Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain and overcame the grave. Lord, I thank you for the inexhaustible hope. Jesus, I thank you that you came, that you humbled yourself, that you lowered yourself, not setting aside your deity, not setting aside your glory, but humbled yourself to become a human like us so that you can relate and know exactly what we're going through. Jesus, I pray this morning that we be a church that clings to you. Lord, as the woman went to great lengths to touch your robe to stop her bleeding, the faith that she had, I pray that is us, Lord. Lord, that when everything's going south, when everything is broken, Lord, that no matter how busy we are, we cling to your robe. That it quiets our spirits, that it quiets our souls, that it removes the lies of the enemy, Lord Jesus. Lord, I'm so grateful And thankful that on this day, Palm Sunday, that you showed up. Jesus, that you rode in on a donkey, humbling yourself. Knowing fully what you're about to receive, the lashings. But greater than that, Jesus, you knew that the people would turn from you. Yet you took the cross. And Jesus, many of us have turned from you. But we come home. And we ask that you have forgiveness for us. Lord, if there's anyone here today that hasn't placed their faith in you, I pray that you move them into faith. Reveal your goodness, your love for them, your truth. Jesus, as we continue through this week, I pray that we reflect upon you. That leads to heartfelt worship, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you. I thank you, Lord God, that today was an normal service. Lord, let us never be a church that becomes comfortable with the norm. 
but let us be a church that's uncom- or comfortable with the uncomfortable. Jesus, we love you. We worship you and we praise you. And in your mighty name we pray, amen. 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 So come back Friday night, 7 p.m. We're gonna have a worship service for Good Friday.